Hi there. Today we're talking about acclimatization for climbing mountains above 14,000 feet in elevation. Hello everyone, I'm Jason, and we're continuing our series of how-to videos for attempting to summit non-technical mountains, 14ers, that's mountains that stand above 14,000 feet. And today we're going to talk about acclimatization, after we've already discussed fitness, gear, and planning your climb. Acclimatization is the process your body goes through to adapt to the reduced oxygen you take in with each breath at altitude. And we're going to talk about what's going on with your body when you go to higher altitude, what the negative consequences could be if you acclimate poorly, and basic strategies that support your body's ability to acclimate well. As a side note, there actually isn't less oxygen the higher you go. There's less air pressure, so the oxygen is more spread out. The result is that each breath you take in brings in fewer oxygen molecules. How many fewer molecules? You get about 43% of the oxygen intake at 14,000 feet as you would at sea level. But for us to talk about what to do to acclimate and for it to make sense, we need to talk a bit about what's going on with your body and your physiology. Well, that's a very big question with a very long answer, but I think the summary statistic is that normal blood oxygen saturation is baseline at sea level. That's 100%. It's now the upper 90s if you're in, say, Denver at 5,000 feet, and you're in the upper 80s if you're on top of a 14er. You have less oxygen in your blood. If you were at sea level and a doctor saw a blood oxygen saturation in the 80s, you'd be immediately admitted to the intensive care unit. But you don't need to go to the intensive care unit when you're on top of a 14er, so what's your body doing? Well, it's compensating to help get more oxygen to your cells and tissues you'll breathe faster and deeper to get more oxygen in. Your heart rate increases to push that oxygenated blood around your body faster. You'll urinate more, and there's a multi-step reason behind it. Your kidneys release a hormone that tells your bone marrow to produce more oxygen-carrying red blood cells. And to make room for these blood cells, you need to dump fluid from your blood that fluid eventually is released through urine. Also, as a result of shedding that fluid, your blood actually gets thicker. Finally, the increased respiration causes a decrease in CO2 in your blood. You're just breathing more CO2 out more quickly. That decrease in CO2 results in your blood pH rising. Here, again, your kidneys kick in and pull bicarbonate from the blood to balance your pH level. So what happens when things don't go well? The results of poor acclimatization can range from headache to acute mountain sickness to pulmonary edema to cerebral edema. Okay, what's going on here? So headache is usually due to dehydration. The combination of more active urination, increased respiration, which also releases water vapor, and the less humid air that you get at altitude can all lead to dehydration. The big takeaway here is that dehydration not only causes headache, but it also means that your kidneys aren't operating optimally. And if your kidneys aren't operating optimally, you aren't getting the red blood cells to be produced that you need, and you aren't balancing your electrolytes, and you can't manage your blood's pH levels. The engine of acclimatization is your kidneys. You can think of food as the fuel you give your body's engine to give you the energy to get up the mountain. You can think of water as the fuel for your acclimatization engine, so you need both. If you've ever heard of people warning others off of drinking summit beers because of the strangely pronounced negative effects at altitude, this is why. Alcohol is a diuretic, which causes you to urinate even more, which causes you to become dehydrated faster. Acute mountain sickness, or AMS, can include symptoms like worsening headache to nausea and vomiting, fatigue, dizziness, tunnel vision, slurred speech, and memory loss. Anyone want to climb while dizzy, tired, having trouble seeing, unable to communicate, unable to remember land markers, and getting dehydrated even faster because you're vomiting? Sure, you might not get all of these symptoms, but isn't one enough? And here's the thing. Likelihood of acute mountain sickness is not correlated with fitness. 
It can strike the fit and the unfit. It can strike those who have been to altitude before and newbies to the heights. Sir Edmund Hillary, yes, one of the first two summiters of Everest, along with Tenzing Norgay, later in his life could not go above 14,000 feet due to persistent AMS. What we do know, however, is that uber fit people who climb too high, too fast to acclimate well, actually do increase their risk of getting acute mountain sickness. Usually, the primary factor in onset of AMS is failure to control the blood pH, and the only treatment for AMS that is effective in the short term is to head down. AMS symptoms can also create more immediately life-threatening issues. One of these potential life-threatening symptoms is pulmonary edema. Edema, or swelling, is caused by your body not being able to absorb that fluid that's being dumped out of your blood to make room for the extra red blood cells. It becomes pulmonary edema when that swelling is in your lungs. This, of course, makes your lungs kind of waterlogged, impacting their ability to bring in oxygen, which only creates a vicious cycle. Now you have even more hypoxia, or oxygen starvation, which in turn increases the shedding of fluid, and the symptoms get worse until you end up in respiratory failure. How are you doing? Hard. Very rapid resting heart rate, chest pains, blue skin or lips, and crackling in the lungs are all indicators of HAPE, or high altitude pulmonary edema. Again, getting the heck down is the best solution. And then there is cerebral edema, or swelling of the brain. High altitude cerebral edema, or HACE, can progress very rapidly and also typically results in massive loss of coordination, sensory loss, and loss of executive function. You can see how getting down with haste may be an impossibility. So it's best to be on the lookout for the early symptoms, such as intense headache, extreme weakness, disorientation, and even hallucination. Edemas occur in about half of a percent of adults at 14,000 feet and up to 8% of those under age 16. So the governing strategy is to catch any symptoms of acute mountain sickness and use that as an immediate turnaround. If AMS progresses to an edema, you're in real trouble. And one of the medical profession's rules of thumb on this is that if you experience AMS symptoms and are at altitude, assume it's AMS. Your nausea isn't likely to be from something you ate. It's likely to be due to the altitude. So if you throw up and therefore feel better because you threw up, don't assume that you're gonna stay that way. If you keep going up, you'll soon be sick again. All right, so that's all the bad stuff that can happen, but how can you be sensible and tilt the odds towards good acclimatization? Well, remember what I said about food and water driving your energy and your acclimatization? Well, we start with that. I try to make it a point to take in water every 30 minutes on a climb. And I take in food every 60 minutes. This keeps those two various engines primed. One of the things about dehydration, and you've heard me mention this in my last video on planning your 14er climb, is that by the time you feel thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's why I make sure I take in water every 30 minutes. Does that mean that if you get dehydrated, you will definitely acclimate poorly? No, but you're increasing the risk that you will. So beyond the food and water, there are also things that you can do to make marginal but effective improvements on your intake of oxygen. One of the things that you can do is try to avoid unnecessarily getting out of breath. For example, after taking a rest, don't start out walking uphill at a normal pace. You wanna start slower than your body thinks it can go. This will allow your resting heart rate to gradually increase rather than jump, and that will in turn help your respiration gradually increase rather than get you panting. Remember, panting is losing water vapor faster. You can make use of the rest step, which is where you momentarily pause resting on your straight back leg with each step that you take forward. Again, this is something you can do at steeper sections, not just to manage your energy output, which is where I see most people apply this technique, but rather also to manage your breathing, keeping it steady and again, conserving some of that water vapor. Another on the trail technique is pressure breathing. This is breathing out fully and forcefully through pursed lips. By adding some resistance to your exhale, you increase the pressure in the lungs, which combats the decrease in air pressure around them at altitude. 
This facilitates better gas exchange in the alveola. So if that's the micro view of what you can do while you're taking steps, what about the big macro view of your approach to moving up the mountain and at what pace? Well, your body starts its physiological adaptations at around 5,000 feet in altitude. Of course, for those of us that are living at that altitude or above, we are very well adapted to that height. But for those of you coming from lower elevations to climb 14ers, be aware that acclimatization starts in town, not at the mountain. Edemas start to become a real concern at around 8,000 feet in elevation, but they can also happen lower. So think of 8,000 feet as another major stop on your acclimatization journey. Once at that point, the recommendations are to not sleep at a point that's higher than 1,000 to 1,500 feet above your last night's sleep on any single day. This can be a problem for those attempting a day hike. We aren't going to turn every 14er into an overnight or multiple overnight trip. But let's talk about why that's the recommendation so that we can talk about how to extract some of the benefits, even if following a slightly different strategy. Acclimatization at a particular altitude takes one to three days. The idea of not going up more than 1,000 to 1,500 feet is that you need to build in the time for that gradual adjustment. But you can also build in a more aggressive program like climbers do on the big 7,000 and 8,000 meter peaks by climbing high and sleeping low. In this scenario, you're trying to get 3,000 feet higher than your sleeping altitude. So a lowlander's acclimatization schedule for a 14er may look something like sleep in town on the first day. Say that you're at 5,000 or 6,000 feet and focus that day on hydration. Climb to 8,000 or 9,000 feet. There's a lot of great peaks at these heights. And then come back again and sleep in town. Then visit an elevated trailhead, say at around 12,000 feet, and return to a lower trailhead or a nearby camp area that's around 9,000 feet. Then you're ready to make your attempt after that, if everything's been going smoothly. So what you've just done is come into town at 5,000 feet, climbed to eight or 9,000 feet, but slept at five, moved up to eight, climbed to 12, but slept back at eight or nine. Then you are ready to make that attempt on your 14er. Now that is a pretty aggressive program. It's only about four days. So listen to your body if those dehydration headaches or other AMS symptoms kick in. Even two hours at lower elevation has been shown to make a big difference. So head back down, focus on water, and maybe you'll be ready to try it again. And keep in mind that if you have experienced AMS, you are now more likely to experience it again. So you wanna make maybe even smaller adjustments in your sleeping altitude on your next series of attempts. And the sleeping at altitude is the key because that's when you spend enough time at an elevation for your acclimatization engine to really kick in. For those of us who are lucky enough to live at altitude, we get to keep going back up as often as our desires and schedules allow. This allows us to build up adapted red blood cells that then take months to die off. Of course, not that many red blood cells get made on just a day hike, but because they take so long to die off, you can build them up over time. So by adding in and stacking weekends together, you can end up with quite a positive adaptation. So if I had to give some summary advice, it would be this. If you're coming from the flatlands, build in the days to do a progression of climb high, sleep low. Focus on hydration so that your amazing kidneys can do their job. And once you're on the peak, do what you can to modulate your speed and steps to keep your respiration, sure labored, but not panting. And lastly, science doesn't understand why some people's physiologies acclimate well and other people's don't. So don't congratulate yourself too much or berate yourself too much either if this proves to be either an easy or challenging process. Just do what you can to maximize your odds. Amazing. <laughs> Do you have any acclimating strategies that you found have worked for you? Let us know in the comments. 
If you want additional thoughts related to this video and every video that we produce, along with links to the equipment we discuss, sample gear lists, sample itineraries, and links to other outdoor resources, please visit our website at shortguysbetaworks.com. The link's in the description below. And if you want to be alerted as we release new content, please subscribe and ring that bell. We produce educational content like this, as well as short films of our family adventures, and we release something new every week. So if you have ideas for content that you'd like to see, you can put those ideas in the comments section too. We'll see you next week and keep on getting more out of that big outside.